it does. I assume it did. Are you, so the tune is definitely different in the Psalter hymnal? It's not in here. Oh, really? It's not in there. Please stand as we sing Psalm 100, All People That On Earth Do Dwell.
you pray with me? Great God and Heavenly Father, we bow before you this night in reverence and in awe and thanksgiving. We rejoice in you on this occasion of the commencement of these candidates for graduation, and we glorify your name for the praise of your glory. We celebrate your work among these students. And in these moments, I ask for the sunshine of your face, the presence of your Holy Spirit, that he would abide with us as friends and family, faculty, staff, and especially upon these men who you have trained and equipped with all spiritual wisdom and knowledge. Would you cheer their hearts and confirm to them this holy calling to proclaim your gospel to take the good news to the nations that all people on earth would sing to you with cheerful voice. Now would your spirit rest and remain upon us this evening. May all that is done and said be glorifying to you in these exercises. This I ask through and in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our great High Priest, who is the power and wisdom of God. Amen. Uh, we have a um, great student body, and our student body is such uh, their servants, and every pastor has to be a servant. And at the conference and this and other occasions, uh, last night, they waited on us at the graduate dinner, and they were there long afterwards and back again this morning, cleaning up. Uh, we are very appreciative for their ushering and their cleaning up. Uh, Darren Brown, our maintenance uh, gentleman, uh, for his uh, setup. And uh, always thankful for uh, Miss Charity Van Duty Ward for playing the piano uh, for us. Um, and Rob Dykes, who's assistant pastor at Sovereign Grace PCA Church in Charlotte, uh, who also is our art director, and he prepared the brochure. Our um, speaker tonight is Pastor Chris Strevel, who's the pastor of Covenant. Buford Orthodox Presbyterian Church. I, I knew of him a long time before I met him. Uh, he is a preacher, greatly blessed of the Lord, and we're very thankful. What we do uh, at the service, I can tell you more about uh, Pastor Shrivel. He's ordained minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and he's been there at Covenant Presbyterian since 1995. Buford is a suburb this side of Atlanta. He resides in Suwannee, Georgia, with his wife Elizabeth. They have five children, uh, and his hobbies are trains and bicycles and books. When are you going to grow up? 
His Winnie the Pooh collection is really good. <laughs> but we're very thankful. One of the customs that we began a number of years ago was uh, at commencement is to have uh, pastors and elders from the churches of graduates. Now, Chris is the pastor of uh, Mr. Ben Castle, and we are thankful that uh, uh, Chris could participate tonight. But we were led in the opening prayer by Pastor Jonathan Williams, who is the pastor of uh, Fairview PCA, and uh, Duncan Hoops, another one of our seniors, has been interning there for a number of years, at least three, I think, right? Two. Uh, And then we have uh, Mr. Josh Martin, who uh, hasn't had a lot of time with Kurt Schrader, but Josh is the new solo head pastor at uh, Palmetto Hills PCA. And Josh is a graduate of Greenville Seminary, and uh, he will be um, reading uh, the scripture. And then uh, Mr. Terry Richards, who is a ruling elder at Fellowship PCA, and that's where Michael Grasso has been interning for a number of years as well. So we seek to incorporate uh, men from the home churches uh, at the service, and we're so thankful that these men could be with us uh, tonight. This time, let us stand now and sing uh, the church's one foundation and inside cover of your program.
please remain standing as I read from Luke chapter 4. This is God's holy word. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. And if you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Please be seated. That's good. To the board of trustees, I praise the Lord. To the faculty of uh, the seminary, I bless the Lord, praise the Lord. You're often in my prayers. To the graduates uh, this year, you are also uh, in my prayers. And when I receive the invitation... Uh, to be with you this evening. This is the first passage that came into my mind. And I regret it. Because it is our Lord's personal history. It is glorious, deep. And it is particularly relevant, though, for seminary graduates and for young men who are determined to preach the everlasting gospel. And I think its relevance lies first in five ways. We won't belabor these. But you need to be ready to be tempted, tested, like our Lord was first because He is your master. And the servant is not greater uh, than His master, than His Lord. You will be like Him. He will make you like Him. You remember that He's just come off of a glorious episode. Baptized, His public ministry uh, commenced. The voice from heaven, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Spirit descending upon Him and immediately, says Mark, the Spirit drove Him into the wilderness. And so I would take note, young gospelers, that if you intend to be like your master, expect to be sifted. Because second, you need to learn obedience as he is learning obedience. It's unfathomable at one level. We look at this. Did he really go through this? Did he was he tempted for these 40 days? And then Satan saves these three uh, dynamo temptations for the very end. How did he subject himself to this? Why would he subject himself to this? Did he really feel these things? And if yes, of course, we must say that it was because of who he was that he felt these temptations so acutely. And if he needed to learn obedience by the things that he suffered, if he needed to be tempted in every way for us, be assured that you need to learn obedience as well because you cannot... Be filled with yourself and fit to serve the master. Remember that you are following him. And therefore he will make you like him. 
You were also third vulnerable. He is being tempted and tested at the very outset of his public ministry. You are just starting your race. You are untried. And fourth, you go to war against Satan. I know, of course, our Lord saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He said, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world judged. And the gospel goes forth. Satan is still filled with malice, Revelation 12, 17, against the church. He hates the Word of God. We see here, we won't have time to look into this, but his sniveling, insinuating malice. If you are the Son of God, look at you. You look like an emaciated scarecrow. If you're so hungry and you're really the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. You want a kingdom? You want Psalm 2? Don't you know your father has Psalm 22 prepared for you? Take the easy way out. Temptations particularly suited and attractive to him who was to bear our sorrows. The sorrows of death and the sorrows of hell. And then coming through that one, oh, you you trust the word of God, do you? Throw yourself down from this pinnacle and show everyone who you really are. You, you, met, you, you face, my young brothers, an enemy who hates you. Who would like to kill you. He is a murderer from the beginning. He would like to sidetrack you. Uh, if you have taken upon yourself the calling to proclaim the everlasting gospel, your enemy is not the Democrats, the Republicans, the Socialists, the Communists. They're all mutes, fools, impotents in comparison to the great enslaver and murderer of men, the evil one. So you need to watch. You're just starting out in your race. You face an incredible enemy. And frankly, he's too strong for you. He is too strong for you. He's too strong for me. He's too strong for any of our august brothers and mentors here. He's not too strong, lastly, for the Word of God. And, la- and the reason I really bring this passage to your attention tonight is that you must learn to fight with the Word of God alone. And we'll see a little bit about what that means as we go through here. But this is our Lord Jesus. You know, some would say, I've had even people of yours, why didn't he just zap Satan and be done with it? Well, remember, this is our captain going forth for us. He didn't need to do this for himself. He's doing this as the great mediator, the great captain of our salvation, the great surety. And he wants to show us what a few little snippets from Deuteronomy will do for us. What a few little snippets from God's Word, believed, held fast to, in the worst of circumstances, will do. You need to teach Jesus. Uh, You need to ask Jesus to teach you how to fight like he did, trusting God's word alone. Now, these three temptations have a particular, I think, relevance for young gospel ministers. They're relevant for every believer, but tonight my focus will be uh, on these brothers here before us. Remember the first temptation, again, we can't do anything like a deep dive, but stones to bread. You're hungry. Take care of yourself. Your father's forsaken you. You're the son of God. He doesn't care about you. Look at you. You look like a corpse. You look pathetic. Now, this was a direct attack upon our Savior's faith. You might say, Jesus had faith? Absolutely. He trusted his father. The Jews, when they threw it in his teeth, when he was on the cross and hung naked between heaven and earth, he trusted God Let God deliver him, seeing he delights in him. Our Savior trusted his Father. And here Satan throws it in his teeth. Yeah, eat this gravel of love your Father has given you. Take matters into your own hands. Now, my young brothers, there will be times where you may well ask very simply in the course of your ministry, will my Father provide for me? How will the church fare in if economic times become tumultuous. Can I adjust my definition of adequate provision should persecution or poverty ensue? Will my father take care of me? Or 
even a deeper level. Why am I sometimes in the wilderness? Why is this course that I'm on so difficult? Why do I not have more joy? Why do I feel depressed? Has my father forgotten me? Where is his help? And the temptation to you, like to our Lord, was take matters into your own hands. God does not love you. You're, you, you, it's not so much, I think, that Satan doubted that Jesus was the Son of God. It was just a sniveling, insinuating, malicious, he cannot understand love. He cannot understand. I wouldn't serve God with our outward circumstances that look like this, but of course he wouldn't serve God when he was the fairest of heaven, would he? His second temptation, of course, our Savior answers, man shall not live by bread alone, and we'll talk about that in a moment. I'm going to look at the temptations and then the responses. The second temptation, of course, when he sees that Jesus is not going to uh, bend, but is going to continue to eat rocks rather than distrust his Father's care. Okay, you know where this is leading you. Listen, you want a kingdom? Uh, Let me show you all the kingdoms of the world and the glory. They're given to me again Part truth, part lie. We won't get into all the theological implications of that, but he is a liar. He only has authority and power that men in their unbelief and rebellion give him. He's on the leash of God and now of his Christ at the right hand of the Father. But here's the offer. You don't have to go through the cross to get the crown. You want the kingdom? You want to avoid the sorrows of hell and the pains of death? Now how much? Satan knew of Scripture, I will not venture to say. He certainly knew Psalm 91, 11, and 12, to quote it by heart. He shall give his angels charge concerning you. He had a large, long time up to this point to nurse his poisonous, bitter mind, twisting Scripture. But at some level, there was that sense. He knew Psalm 22, perhaps. You don't have to go through the cross. You can have the crown without all you have to do is fall down and worship me. Closely related, I would say to our young brothers that two things, and that is to endure hardship as a good soldier first. Learn to die daily. Don't seek an easy path for yourself. Do the difficult. Don't take shortcuts in your study. Especially, don't take shortcuts in your praying. Because whatever good you hope to do, you have to draw it straight down from heaven from the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have any strength. Your library has no strength. Your seminary notes have no strength. The sermons you prepared in seminary have no strength unless you draw down the blessing of heaven. Don't avoid the cross. Learn with the apostle to die daily. Don't be afraid to do the lowest, to wash feet and to take no and to have no notice for yourself. Cross avoidance. Cross avoidance. We live in a very prosperous time comparatively for the church. It's easy to, I want an easier way. I want to avoid the cross. I don't want difficulties. The third temptation, the evil one comes to our Lord. Maybe there's some gaps between these three main temptations. It's hard to say. But he says, okay, you want to trust Scripture when our Lord says you shall worship the Lord your God and Him only shall you worship. You want to trust Scripture? All right, put Him to the test. Fall down, throw yourself down from this pinnacle. And if you're really the Son of God, there's no way you can die. Because God has said in Psalm 91 that He will give His angels charge over you and they will come swooping down from heaven. And undoubtedly, You won't have to be in obscurity anymore because this is in Jerusalem and everybody will see this and you'll be able to make your claims public. Why would you let your father keep you so humble? Why would you let your father keep you so lowly in the wilderness, so obscure? Put him to the test. Let's prove this thing right now. Again here, it reminds us when our Lord quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 in response That you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The context there, of course, is when the children of Israel challenged and tested God at Massa and Meribah in the wilderness and said, is the Lord among us or not? Prove it. Prove it. And of course, we know they provoked him. They provoked him because we're not 
authorized to make God prove anything to the young men, I would say, trust God to validate your ministry. Don't, don't push yourself forward. Uh, do nothing presumptively. God is not going to live with you and with your sins, so you've got to get rid of one of them. He's going to purge you. Don't test him. Don't provoke him. And don't ask him to prove, Lord, if I'm really, if you're real, we, we, we've got too much of this in the church. We need to change our worship. This isn't working. We need to change our doctrine. This isn't working. Again here, Satan wants our Lord to take matters into his own hands, to draw attention to himself. And the Lord Jesus says, I'm going to embrace obscurity in the wilderness because I'm not my own servant. John the Baptist comes to mind here, you know, where the Jews are encouraging him, put yourself forward, show everybody that you're really God's servant. And John says, he must increase, but I must decrease. Make your joy the bridegroom. Expect temptations, young brothers, stones to bread. Are you going to trust God to provide for you? Cross avoidance. This is not a cross affirming culture and you're part of it and you breathe the poison just like I do. But don't avoid. Learn to die daily. Remember what Jesus said and the disciples call is to you in a more intense way if you're going to take up the banner of the cross and that is if any man will come after me let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Not follow men, not follow systems, follow me. Now, I want us to look specifically at Jesus' answers here because we're supposed to imitate him and we're going to break them up a little bit more to the first temptation. Make some food for yourself. Use your power. Prove that you're the word of God. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8.3 and he says, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. How did Jesus beat off this temptation? He's hungry. He's been fasting. I like what Calvin says. He was so busy fighting for 40 days. He really didn't think about food, but was miraculously kept alive, like Moses on Mount Sinai. And then at the end of it, he had a gnawing hunger. And then Satan comes and says, Hey, you're hungry, aren't you? God's left you to yourself. And what did our Lord chew on there? He chewed on God's promises. He chewed on God's word. Remember something, young ministers of the gospel. You are a servant of the word and you must eat it constantly. I like what the Waldensians required of their pastors before they would be ordained. And that is every young minister had to memorize the entirety of the New Testament, big blocks of the Old Testament, all the Psalms, all of Isaiah. Why? Well, because if you're going to fight the devil... There's only one weapon, and that is the Word of God. Like we sing in Luther's hymn, one little word will fail him, but you've got to know the Word, and you've got to memorize it, and you've got to meditate on it, and you've got to eat it, because remember, God's Word is the sword of the Spirit. It was our Savior's shield. Imagine our captain. It would have been such a different picture. Jesus comes out there, you know, in good Lord of the Rings fantasy, and he's got the magic ring on his finger, and he's wielding power and shooting laser beams from every orifice of his body, and he's just destroying the evil one. That would be, oh, that's impressive. But he comes quoting, I mean, in our day especially, you know, hyper grace, here we go. He quotes Deuteronomy 8, 3. He quotes from the Old Testament. He quotes from the Pentateuch. God's Word. When there are no other helps, and it looks like there is no other bread and no other strength to move forward an inch, if you eat the Word, you will find strength. Because there is nothing more powerful than God's Word if you eat it, like God told Jeremiah, if you digest it, if you live it, if you use it, I would encourage every one of you Along with your studying, studying for sermons, that's a fine thing. Your sermons will grow deeper, quicker. If you will eat many other passages of Scripture, memorize Scripture, meditate upon Scripture, it's the only thing that will defeat the evil one. And when you minister to people, they don't need your pithy advice. 
They need the eternal word that's established in the heavens, particularly now when you've got a million internet popes and everybody's spewing all kind of, you know, this is my opinion, I think this. What does God say? Here's our little champion. Here's our little captain. In this picture, intentional, emaciated, dirty. I mean, you know what Isaiah said? There's no form or godliness I mean, that we would desire him. There's nothing outwardly beautiful or attractive. He didn't walk around with his feet like this or a halo, an aegis over him. He didn't walk around like that. He was dirty, dusty, hungry. From all outward appearances, he looked more like a vagabond or an escaped criminal. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that comes out of the mouth of God, quite a far cry, isn't it, from Adam, who had everything and only had one negative and would not live by God's word. Very different from the children of Israel in the wilderness who had manna from heaven coming down every day and meet in the evening and they had God's word and dad, dad, dad. All they would do was complain, this is no good. Here's our Savior who has nothing. He has none of the beauty of Eden. He has none of the provision of the wilderness. Doing hand-to-hand combat with the evil one and allowing himself to basically be manhandled by that villainous worm. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So make sure you know that word. Make sure you eat that word. The second response that he made when offered a kingdom without having to pass through uh, the cross and that horror, that horror, he said, God alone is to be worshipped and feared. Interesting, we don't have time, but if you look at Deuteronomy 6, the context, God says there, he, when he gives that command, he says, when you come into the promised land and you've got gardens and vineyards and you're just having a fine old time, be careful that you don't worship the other gods. Boy, what a warning for this apostatizing nation. When you've got everything, be careful that you don't become a political polytheist. When you have everything, be careful that you don't become a religious polytheist and multiculturalist, lest you forget the Lord. But here's Jesus. He has nothing. Everything outwardly has been taken away from him. And he's offered, and now again, to, to appreciate this second temptation, how exquisitely evil the devil is. Now, Satan didn't know. He, he didn't have foresight. He's just a creature. But at some level, we can look at like Gethsemane. Whoa, this would have been our Savior. If there's any other way. I mean, we, 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 we tend to think, well, Jesus was the Son of God. Therefore, he didn't feel any of this. He just kind of went through all of this. Let me tell you something. When Mark says in Mark 14, 34, that he began to be amazed and exceedingly sorrowful. It was as if he stood in our place on the final day when the crack of doom was opened in front of us and we had heard, depart you forsaken. I don't know you into the pit. And he stood there and looked at that for us and it began to convulse his soul with horror at the cup of judgment that he was about to drink. And then tell me that a temptation like this would have had no. Of course, he was repulsed by it. But avoid the cross. Avoid being, it pleased the Father to bruise me and put me to grief. Him who is daily my delight. Rejoicing always. I always do those things that please my Father. and He's going to judicially forsake me as I become an offering for sin. The horror and the weight of it is too great and too magnificent. And he sees perhaps a little bit of this here because he knows the scripture and he knows that before Psalm 2, there's Psalm 22. Before Psalm 45, there's Isaiah 53. He knows this. He's going to give his back to the smiters. He's going to make his soul an offering for sin. And what does he say when given the easy way out? You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. Him only shall you fear. What He sends, I'm going to bless Him for it. What He brings into my life, I'm not going to fight against it. Young men like your master, I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to say, couldn't I have had an easier road? Why did I get these elders? Of course, they may be, always remember, young men, 
If you ever ask yourself, why did I get these elders? They're probably asking the same thing about you. God doesn't make, again, this is the remedy for, you know, a complaining, a morose spirit among ministers. I'm going to worship God. I'm his servant. I don't deserve this. this. It's a privilege to serve my master in this way. Do you feel this? Not, it's a right, or I've put all this time in seminary. Or, you know, it is a privilege. We all need more of Mary's. I just want to kiss his feet. I just want to wipe them. And, and brothers, if, you, if you've lost that sense of gospel wonder and love, please find some time and rekindle it. I have to do it all the time. And get that sense again. Now, wait a minute. This isn't about problems and people and politics and all this kind of stuff. This, this is all serving my master, God must be worshipped. I don't deserve an easy road. Do you feel it so? I pray you will and I pray you do. That you see what you are doing and what you are about to undertake as the way that Jesus has privileged you to serve Him. And if you don't feel that, you ought to seriously consider doing something else. On that third temptation, he quotes following Luke's order here. Um, he says, when challenged, you trust the scriptures. You're going to go to the cross. All right, let's put this thing to the test right now. Throw yourself down from here. Angels will come. They'll pick you up. You can't die if you're the son of God. You, you, it's impossible. Jesus says, I can't tempt the Lord, I can't, if we can use Massa and Meribah as the background, which it is in Deuteronomy 6, I, I can't provoke the Lord. Is the Lord among us or not? Prove it now. Give us water. Why in the world has this happened to us? You may run into people like that. If, they, if God's in control, why is all this stuff happening in the world? I don't believe in a God who would let so and so happen. Just be quiet. Don't provoke him. God said one time about uh, Nadab and Abihu who offered strange fire. He says, by those who approach me, I must be reverenced. I must be reverenced. Let me encourage you, young brothers, that the, the, the basics of Christian discipleship and piety, Titus 2, the grace of God that has appeared, that brings salvation to all men, teaches us to deny ungodly lust and to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present. Soberly, righteously, godly. That last word, a word of, 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 of awful reverence and fear. That would be the opposite of putting him to the test. Lord, if this, I'm going to preach this and if it's from you, and, or Lord, I'm going to keep up my ministry here only if you will do this. And maybe there's another layer in this as well for, for Jesus. Maybe... Those who have observed this have been correct that this was a way to get himself in the devil's mind if he can do that, get yourself out of obscurity. Prove yourself in front of everybody. You're in the temple precincts. Kind of what Jesus' brother said about him in John 7. Hey, nobody who wants to be known stays in obscurity. If you're really who you say you are, go up to Jerusalem and show yourself to everybody because then, as John adds, not even his own brothers believed in him. It's hard to be obscure. You know, you might think, man, what I'm doing is so important. And uh, nobody else thinks it is. My wife doesn't even think it is like I do. My children, they just got snotty noses. I don't, they don't think what I'm doing is all that important. And it starts growing up. Well, remember Jesus in the wilderness? Oh, I, I am kind of forgotten out here. Not only am I hungry... And I'll look like a dusty old corpse. And not only if I go this path, I'm going to have to go all the way to the cross, but I'm going to do it in obscurity. Lord, are you, Father, are you with me or not? And Jesus says, I'm not going to tempt. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. You shall not provoke him. You shall not make him prove himself to you. 
Young men, we can be very guilty. What about when you push your way forward? What about when you inversely fish? This is low level, but it happens. When you inversely fish for compliments. When you want to be right at all costs. Oh, God deliver us from discipline cases in seminaries. When five minutes of, you know what? I don't see that this is true of me. But you see it as true of me. And so I'm just going to pray about it. And ask the Lord to show me. And, and will you, how dare that person criticize my preaching. Don't they know I'm an oracle of God? I've got letters behind my name. Brothers, let me encourage you. Be willing. Here's John. He, John, I know what Jesus said. He was least in the kingdom of God's greater than John. But what a model for us. You know, everybody, and I already mentioned him, but I'll mention him again. Everybody's coming to John saying, hey, John, Jesus is taking all your disciples. And John just smiles and says, good. Good. I don't want people to follow me. I'm not trying to, we've had enough in the church in these last 20 and 30 and 40 years of personality cults. We're not followers of men. Read 1 Corinthians. Be willing to be obscure. Remember Jesus had, remember in the wilderness when the church was organized, there was captains of tens, captains of fifties, captains of hundreds, captains of thousands. Be content to be a captain of ten. And do your very best in the little place that God may give you and just serve Him with all your might and learn to see His smile and learn to trust His promises and don't make Him prove anything to you. Don't make him, you know, Lord, if you really loved me, you wouldn't leave me like this. You'd make my church bigger. Man, there's going to be a whole parade of preachers on that last day. No, they didn't write books. Nobody remembers them. They didn't get biographies. But so many people are going to come up to those preachers and say, Brother, that sermon that you preached, I know you don't remember it. It was a long time ago, but God used that in my life. To bring me to a saving knowledge of himself. And I would not be here if it wasn't for you. Nobody, it's not in the newspapers. Nobody writes books. You know, why does God even use preaching anyway? Read the end of 1 Corinthians. God doesn't use preaching. So the preachers walk around their finery and talk about, you know, well, this is what you know, my church is doing for me and all this. God used preaching so that we would all remember our place. That pre f preach that's foolish. Greeks look at, pff, that's not wise. Jews, stumbling block, a crucified Savior. But, remember what the Apostle said, God chose preaching so that no one would glory in His presence. Nobody would, look at us, we got it. Make sure at the seminary, my dear, dear brothers whom I respect and board I, I pray for, make sure you remember that this applies just as much to reformed people as not reformed people, that God hates pride. He hates it. He hates it. And he says, pride? Bye. Bye. I'm not using you. I'm not using you. Unless you look at everything that I've given you the truth, the systems, the history. Oh, what a blessed history we have. History of theology, history of doctrine, history of the church, history of missions. Boy, you, you can't even begin to read everything God's done. And every time we read that, we should say, wow. Lord, you have been so kind. It was all of your grace. It was all of you. We, we were, you, God is the God who uses dead people to bring life to the world. That no flesh, and at some level Jesus anticipates all this. I'm not going to provoke. <laughs> I'm not going to put God to the test. Well, if, if, if it doesn't work, then, well, Lord, if this is right, you know, it should work. And it should, you know, just, Lord, if I'm really yours, I should be, I should make myself, no, I need to get a blog. Stupidity is me. Okay, I need to get a blog and tell everybody how smart I am and make sure other people know who don't agree with me, that they're blooming idiots. There's a lot of that that goes on in the Reformed community. And God says, bye. Because if we see the Son of God, our Savior, 
If we see him going out to fight against the prince of darkness, and all he has, all he has is this, but he doesn't have the whole thing, he's just got a little part of it. And he just quotes scripture and he's willing to be mocked for believing it, vilified for believing it, sneered at for believing it. Because why? He loves his father and he loves his people. He loves his father and he loves his people. You're not going to rise any higher than that example. If you've been a preacher for 50 years, if you hadn't quite started yet, learn these things. It's not about us. We've got nothing to give men. It's God who raises the dead. It's God who gives grace. Let me encourage you, whatever you go through, brothers, wherever God calls you, and I pray that He uses you to turn multitudes to the way of righteousness, because boy, we need that in our day and age, don't we? Remember the instruments that God uses, and look at them right there in the wilderness, in our Savior, and you'll see the kind of man He'll use. By the way, you'll see the kind of woman he'll use in homes. You'll see the kind of daddy he'll use in homes. I got all the answers. Wife, I don't have to respect you. I'm the head of my home. You better do what I say, or I'm going to take you before the elders. Men, if any of you have that attitude, we need to take you out behind the barn, okay, and teach you some corporal humility. Look at the Savior. He's doing hand-to-hand combat, and he's showing us. It's by the meekness before God's Word. That's what I'm going to eat. I don't have anything else but rocks and dust, and I'm thirsty. But I'm going to trust my Father's promises. Yep, the way's tough. And he knew it. He knew Psalm 40. They're going to pull out my beard. They're going to give my back to the smiters. I'm going to have to give my cheeks to those who rip out my beard. I'm going to be spat on. Can you imagine that? When you think about the Son of God, holy, harmless, undefiled, being spit on by all these soldiers and these Jews and chief priests going by, just please understand that's you, that's your spit, that you would receive in hell forever under the mockery of demons and the wrath of God if God Himself in His Son did not take that for you. And so what are we, I'm going to worship, I'm going to worship the God of grace. Whatever he brings into my life, if it's a cross, if it's a disease. I had a dear brother, dear brother in the church, our church back in Atlanta died not long, a couple years ago. And I had the privilege, I don't, I don't know if I want to share this in public, but I, I'll, I had the privilege of performing just a real menial task for him the day before he died. And he'd been kind of comatose. And he rolled over. And his eyes got real big. And we've been talking a lot about David Livingston. Uh, in the months leading up to that. How at the end of his life. David Livingston. Somebody said. You know David. You've made all these sacrifices. And lost all these things. And he said. I've never made a sacrifice. In the light of my Savior. My dear brother looked over at me. And he just smiled and said. No sacrifice. I'm going to worship the Lord. Whatever he brings into my life. I may not like it. It may be distasteful, but I'm his. And young man, I would just encourage you, erase from your vocabulary phrases like, my life, my time, my music, my movies. You have been bought with a price. Love your Savior. Serve Him. Expect early on that you very likely... We'll go through some difficult testing and temptations. Particularly if Jesus is going to use you. Because you need to be sifted. And if you're an older minister, you need to be sifted too. So we'll pray for each other. Because the whole glory in one respect of the Christian ministry is that we get to be like our master. It's enough for the disciple that he be like his Lord. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we praise you for your grace and your kindness to us. We praise you for this example. We praise you for your humiliation. We praise you for showing us how to beat the devil. And I pray that you would hold forth these young brothers here, that they would love your word and eat it, that it would take hold of their souls, that it would possess them, 
they would find it sweet, invigorating, sustaining against every temptation and every wile of the evil one. Bless them. Help the good things that they've learned in this beloved, much needed institution to be a blessing to them, to bear much fruit in their lives. Bless us all because we all come before you this evening because we want to follow Jesus and be Christians. Lord, help us to walk worthy of you unto all pleasing. Help us to be fruitful in every good work to do your will. Help us to increase in your knowledge. Strengthen us with might according to your glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. And we pray, O oh Lord, that the preaching of your gospel again from these brothers here and from all here would, would be the sword of your spirit and would turn many to righteousness and that you would thrust in your gospel sickle into this jaundiced, spiritually burned over, consumerist land and you would draw multitudes to fill their need of the cleansing blood and justifying righteousness of Jesus Christ. We pray that you would bless them, encourage them, use them, build them up. And Lord, since you've already won the battle, I pray, O oh Lord, that they would be careful to appropriate the victory and the way to the victory in their lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor, for opening the word to us in a blessed, blessed, Holy Spirit anointed way. Let us uh, respond now by singing uh, a hymn that celebrates the grace of God, uh, by grace alone, uh, inside your back flap of the uh, program. Stand in as we sing.
Please be seated. If the uh, gentleman from the board will come forward, please. Mr. President, I will present to you the Master's Divinity Class of 2019, Master of Divinity. The gentleman will come around, please. Mr. Benny Albert Castle. God bless you. A lot of rednecks here, huh? Huh? Not a redneck shirt. <laughs> Mr. Michael Frederick Grasso. Mr. Duncan Rainey, Sr. God bless. Mr. Melvin Isaac. Mr. Brian C. McCullough. Mr. Stephen Paul Spinnin Weber. <laughs> Love you. Love you. Mr. David Trenton Steele. Still. <laughs> God bless you. And brand new Papa, Mr. Curtis William Strader. In absentia, Mr. Florian Wicken. Florian is our third graduate at our extension school in Gateshead, Newcastle, Britain. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I present to you the Master of Arts candidate, Mr. Jerry Richard Bressler Cabot. Thank 
Mr. Chairman, I present to you a candidate for Master of Theology, Mr. Scott Charles Cook. This time, Dr. Shaw will come lead us in a prayer of dedication for our graduates. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we are always in your presence. But it is on occasions such as this that we are perhaps particularly aware of that fact that we stand or we sit before the presence of God the Father, God the Spirit, and particularly in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge both the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. We pray for these men this evening that by the power of your spirit and to the honor of Christ and the Father, that you would enable them to preach the word, to be ready, to be urgent in season and out of season, that from the word they might convince, they might rebuke, they might exhort, and that they might do so with all long-suffering and teaching. For we live in a time, Lord, when people, even in the church, will not endure sound doctrine, but will search out teachers for themselves, who will tickle their ears, who will satisfy their desires, and they will turn away from the truth, and they will be turned aside to fables. But make these men... Make all your ministers watchful in all things. Strengthen them to endure afflictions. Open their mouths to do the work of an evangelist. In all things, enable them to fulfill their ministry. For we ask in Jesus' name, the one who fulfilled his ministry completely and perfectly, that we following in his steps, might fulfill ours. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This time in our program, we make some academic announcements. Uh, About 20 years ago, we were able to begin a uh, ladies' fellowship in the seminary, and strategic in the development of that program was uh, Mrs. Mary Ann Clay, uh, who died uh, shortly after uh, that, and uh, as a way to keep her remembrance as well as to honor one of the uh, wives of our students. Each year, uh, the uh, faculty wives who are in charge of the ladies' fellowship fellowship along with the coordinator this year, Ms. Brenda Benson, um, have uh, awarded this book. And this year, uh, the Mary Ann Clay Award is given to Mrs. Debbie Hoops. I love you. Thank you for your work. It was great. I think Debbie brought a new level of professionalism to much of what we were doing with the ladies, and we're very thankful for her ideas that she brought uh, to us. At this time, I would make some academic announcements. There's been one addition to uh, our board, a Greenville grad, uh, Orthodox Presbyterian uh, chaplain, Cornelius Johnson, who had to get back to duty. 
but we're very thankful that Cornelius, who uh, comes to us, actually, he was at the, I think, at the last meeting, and then from the Presbytery of Connecticut in southern New York of uh, Orthodox Presbyterian Church, Mr. Charles Olivier. Today was his first board meeting. Charles, thank you. And then the uh, appointments for our campus, uh, and then a couple of overseas, but not all of them, for the 2000, this should say 1920 academic year. Board has appointed Dr. Kevin Backus, Mr. Scott Cook, Dr. Tony Curto, Dr. Benjamin Dunson, Dr. Sidney Dyer, uh, Dr. Mr. James Elkin, lecturer in Latin, Mr. Lucas Bumbach, Dr. Ian Hamilton, Pastor Bruno Macedo, Dr. James McGoldrick, Dr. Ryan McGraw, Dr. Michael Morales, Dr. Joseph Piper, William Schweitzer, who is in charge of the program in England, uh, Dr. George Scipione, um, Dr. Benjamin Shaw, and then Dr. C. N. Wilborn, and also uh, Mr. James Wright at the South Africa program. The Summer Institute will be uh, at the end of August. We'll also have an elective this summer uh, in uh, Presbyterian history or theology, and you can go to the website. Uh, we encourage you to take advantage of both of those programs. And our uh, fall commencement will be uh, the third week in September. I encourage you to join us for that as well. At this time, we'll sing. We're finished singing. At this time, Mr. Terry Richards will come and close in prayer. Stand for the prayer, but sit down. I have one more announcement after the prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we run to your throne tonight to thank you, to praise you for the blessings and mercy that you have poured out upon this school, for its faculty, its staff, its board, but mainly for its students that you have brought here and sent back out fully prepared to engage in ministry, to further your kingdom. Lord, we would recognize only King Jesus as the head of our church. And as such, Lord, we would ask you that for these men, for us, for your church, that you would give us men that are ribbed with the steel of your Holy Spirit, men who will not flinch when the battle is fiercest, men who won't compromise or fade when the enemy rages, men who cannot be bought or bullied by the enemy, Men who are willing to stand in the gap and pay the price, make the sacrifice, stand their ground, and hold the torch high. Men obsessed with the principles true to your word. Men stripped of self-seeking, as we have heard tonight. Men who will pay any price and go to any length for truth. Men delivered from mediocrity men with high visions, low pride, faith wide, love deep, and patience long, men who will dare to march to the gates of hell under your banner, men who will not surrender principles of truth in order to accommodate their peers, men more interested in scars than medals, more committed to convictions than convenience, men who will give their lives for the eternal, Men who are fearless in the face of danger, calm in the midst of pressure, bold in the midst of opposition. Men who pray without ceasing, work long, teach clearly, and wait patiently. Men whose walk is by faith, behavior is by principle, whose dreams are in heaven, and whose book is the Bible. These are the men who we want who we need to be equal to the task at hand. Pour your blessings out upon them as they go. Pour your blessings out upon your church. In Jesus' name, our King and Lord, we pray. 
Let all those who agree with this prayer say amen. Amen. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Please be seated. The trustees have asked me to make a special announcement. Um, This is our 29th commencement, and uh, Mr. Grasso said yesterday and wrote an article uh, that we have never had a man graduate with debt from Greenville Seminary. Now, I don't know many other, at least not debt caused here, (laughs) uh, institution uh, that can say that. We thank the Lord for that. But what that means, one of our board members pointed out today that for every dollar that a student brings, it costs at least four more dollars to train them for the ministry. So the Board of Trustees have asked me to uh, distribute a book tonight that Mr. Groff put together for us. These are articles from uh, members of the faculty. Uh, And inside is an envelope. We ask you prayerfully on this occasion to pray about what you can do to further this work. We're at a very important juncture uh, in the life of the seminary, and we need to uh, increase our regular donors. We ask you prayerfully to think about that. We ask you churches uh, to think about that. If there's a church here tonight who's had a student on a waiver program, um, you're tempted to quit giving now, that is actually a violation of your agreement. We need you to keep giving. We make no money uh, when a student's on a waiver program because what the church gives doesn't come near covering what it costs. So we ask you to take this book and be blessed by it. There are some very edifying articles in here. And then prayerfully consider either tonight or in days to come what you can do on this occasion, but also what you can do over the next year to support uh, a work that uh, we really believe that God's called us to do. Our recessional hymn is, uh, O God, our help in ages past, we will stand as we sing the recessional hymn. 